Greetings, my friends, and welcome back once again. Uh, in our last session, the French Revolution proved to be every bit as crazy as advertised, and by the end, we were introduced to a new face in the story, that of the brilliant young general Napoleon Bonaparte. Now, his story is therefore the topic of today's screencast, so it's the rise and fall of Napoleon as the final chapter in the era of the French Revolution. So as we look at Napoleon's story, we're going to break it down into four parts. First, we'll do a quick little bit on his backstory, how he comes to power. Then uh, we'll look at uh, Napoleon's reign in power. What's he doing as dictator? Uh, and then Napoleon as emperor, which he crowns himself in 1804. We'll see that happen. Uh, finally, we'll examine the circumstances that lead to the decline and fall of the great general and emperor in Europe. Now, as we look at all this stuff, we're going to treat it the same way, though, that we've treated uh, the other revolutions that we've studied. And we want to make sure that we're thinking about how well the events of this part of the French Revolution, the last chapter in that era, how well does this align to the ideas of the Enlightenment? How well does this align to the philosophies of classical liberalism? We're going to be thinking about all that as we do this last chapter in the era of the French Revolution. So those are the essential questions. That's what we're covering today. Thus, without further ado, Let's go ahead and get started. So where we left off last time, 1799, Napoleon Bonaparte returns to France from his campaigns in Egypt, and he overthrows the directory. But who is this guy, right? Let's get a little bit of backstory real quick. Napoleon was born on the island of Corsica in 1769. Uh, though ethnically Italian, Corsica was within the borders of French control, thus Napoleon was a French citizen. And he'd always been a supporter of the ideas of the French Revolution from its inception in 1789. He would later on join the French military academy and graduate with a commission as an officer. And he was only able to do this because of the reforms brought about by the French Revolution. Now, a young Napoleon made himself very well known to those above him through his uh, brilliant command of strategy, his discipline, and his ability to lead men in battle. And he really made a name for himself by putting down rebellions against the Directory. All of this led to him being promoted to the rank of general by the time he was 26 years old. An incredible feat in and of itself. Well, it was also around this time that Napoleon met the woman who had become his wife. Her name was Josephine de Beauharnais. She was beautiful, she was ambitious, and her family was very well connected. And Napoleon used his connections with his wife's family to uh, gain his first big command of his career. He was given command of the French armies that were fighting against the Austrians in northern Italy. There he reorganized the troops, he improved their living conditions, he reinstilled discipline, and he led them to a great victory against Austria. This made his name well known throughout Europe, and it made him incredibly popular with the people of France. Oh, and now the directory came to fear him, and rightfully so, I would say. Um, fearing Napoleon's growing power and popularity, the Directory sent him to Egypt to go fight the British. On the surface, they said go to Egypt and cut the British off from their eastern trade, but in reality, it's about getting him as far away from France as possible. And again, can't really blame them, especially since we know how the rest of the story goes, because as we, uh, as we were at when we left off last time and started today... Napoleon left Egypt, returned to France in 1799, overthrew the Directory in a coup d'etat. After taking power, he declared the French Revolution to finally be over. He declared the inception of a new French Republic, when in reality, he's setting himself up as a military dictator to rule France single-handedly. Now, as dictator, Napoleon makes a number of reforms in France. He ends the government corruption that had been rampant during the uh, years of the Directory. He creates a national banking system in France to stabilize the French currency and really bring stability back to the French economy after years of warfare and revolution and conflict. He puts in place a more, uh, a more reformed and efficient tax code, and he restores the Catholic Church to a position of social prominence where they'd been before the years of the Revolution. But uh, most notably, and the biggest, most lasting impact action that he would make would be his creation of a uniform system of national law called the Napoleonic Code. The Napoleonic Code brought together many of the ideas of the Enlightenment and codified them into a uniform national law system. It took things like, you know, natural rights, liberties, freedoms, equality before the law, advancement in society based on merit instead of birth. It took all these things and it put it into a system of law. Now, in reality, it did limit some freedom of speech, and it did limit some freedom of press, but this is still a dictatorship, which, you know, let's be honest, the French knew what was going on. They recognized that Napoleon was a dictator, but they also saw Napoleon as a hero. He, you know, liberated them from the directory and brought stability and peace back to France, so they were kind of willing to look beyond that. So despite its shortcomings, the Napoleonic Code is a huge step forward in law in France and in all of Europe. 
And as we're going to see, Napoleon conquer uh, much of Europe. Napoleonic law code will go with him. So this is going to impact not just French law, but European law for decades to come. And uh, Napoleon, it has to be said, is a is a great administrator of government. He's very organized, uh, very disciplined, very able administrator in government. The guy would stay up late at night, get up super early, all working on government business. Great micromanager, but also good at delegating people to get things done. But we don't talk about Napoleon today because uh, he was a great government organizer. Nobody looks back and says, wow, what an impact this guy had on government. No, people look back at Napoleon for being an incredibly brilliant military commander, because that's exactly what he was. Above all else, the guy was an amazing general. And using his incredible grasp of, of strategy uh, and formations and use of artillery and leadership, he won battle after battle after battle, defeating France's enemies one by one by one, until by 1804 he defeated nearly all of them, expanding the nation's borders and building a European empire. In fact, by 1804, Napoleon was in such a position of power that he even named himself Emperor of France, dropping all pretenses of republic. He even brought the Pope in to do a special coronation ceremony and really shocked everyone when instead of allowing the Pope to crown him, he ripped the crown from the Pope's hands and placed it on his own head. Uh, a sure message to everyone that no one would be above him. He was a self-made man. Nobody crowns Napoleon but Napoleon. And uh, it's, it's a really a show of his power and his confidence. And he's really reaching the height of that power in Europe at this point in time. Now, despite all of his great successes, being emperor and winning all these battles, for all his military victories, Napoleon has one Achilles heel, one thorn in his side, one arch nemesis that he just can't defeat. And that nemesis is the British. And uh, Britain poses a special kind of problem because, you know, it's an island and you have to cross the English Channel to invade there. It's real difficult stuff. And uh, really, when the British Navy defeated the French at the epic Battle of Trafalgar in 1805, Napoleon knew that invading and conquering Britain was completely out of the question anyway. And so with that option off the table, he was really going to have to shift strategy in dealing with the British. Oh, and by the way, because his wars were really, really expensive, Napoleon needed some extra cash. And so to make the extra money to fund the wars, Napoleon decided to sell France's uh, colonial territory in North America to the United States. He sold the Louisiana Territory to the U.S. at the bargain basement price of $15 million. So for less than what some professional athletes make now in a year, the United States doubled its territory. Uh, the U.S. sent ambassadors to France to negotiate the purchase of just New Orleans, but Napoleon offered the entire Louisiana territory for 15 million bucks. That's like four cents an acre. And this is not the last time that Napoleon is going to have an influence on American history. But uh, back to Europe. So recognizing that he couldn't defeat the British militarily, Napoleon tries a new approach. He turns his attention to waging economic warfare against the British by trying to cut them off from trade. And he calls his new strategy the Continental System. See, he orders all nations that he controls or is allied with to cease all trade with Britain. The idea is that since the British Isles uh, are really limited in their capacity to gain and produce resources on their own, if he could cut them off from those resources and that trade, he could break their economy and defeat them without ever having to fight them in battle. So he hoped to weaken them and crush them economically with this Continental System. Now, ultimately, the Continental System failed to hurt England's economy. With England's powerful navy, a trade blockade was really hard to enforce. Um, oh, and, and there's another tertiary effect on the United States here in all of this, because America traded with both Britain and France. And so every time we tried to trade with the French, the British would attack and board and seize our ships. And every time we tried to trade with the British, the French would attack and board and seize our ships. Now, we were willing to look past it with the French because they kind of helped us in that whole American Revolution thing, but when it came to the British, the uh, attacking and seizing of our vessels was one of the things that ultimately led to the War of 1812 between the United States and Britain. See, again, Napoleon impacting American history without ever really even meaning to. What would America be without Napoleon? Who knows? History could have gone a thousand different ways, but it did the way it did, uh, partially because of Napoleon. So the continental system doesn't really work in hurting Britain. In fact, it hurts France more than it does England uh, because, you know, one, uh, Napoleon's allies in Europe really get a bitter taste in their mouth from him forcing them to trade or not trade with certain individuals. Uh, and so this really turns people uh, against Napoleon. And two, it hurts these allies' economies. Also, 
turning people against Napoleon. So the, the Continental System has the exact opposite effect that Napoleon was really hoping it would have. But despite the failure of the Continental System, Napoleon continued to win battles on land, expanding his French Empire. Heck, by 1812, he controlled almost all of Europe. But this would be the high watermark. This would be the height of his power. From 1812 onward, it's all downhill from there. And Napoleon's downfall really began in Spain. Some years earlier, Napoleon had conquered Spain and put his brother Joseph on the throne of that country. Well, Spanish rebels, aided by the British, along with a promising young military officer by the name of Arthur Wellesley, defeated Napoleon's brother Joseph and freed Spain from French control. Now people smell blood in the water. Now people sense weakness. And Russia's Tsar, Alexander I, uh, supposedly an ally of Napoleon, now turned against Napoleon. Of course, he was only allied with Napoleon because back in 1807, Napoleon crushed the Russian armies in battle, and Alexander figured it was safer to be Napoleon's friend than his enemy. Well, now, sensing weakness, the Russians turn against Napoleon, withdraw Russia from the continental system, declare themselves an ally of Britain and an enemy of France. Well, angered at the Tsar's actions, Napoleon plans a massive invasion of Russia for two reasons. One, to punish Russia for their actions, and two, Napoleon needs to show Europe and the world that he's still powerful that he's not weak. 1812 is just not a good year for him, and he needs to show that he's still powerful. And so Napoleon assembles an army of over 400,000 for his invasion of Russia. Their invasion commences in May of 1812, with the main target being the city of Moscow. Now, in response to the invasion, the Tsar institutes what we now call a scorched earth strategy or scorched earth policy. Uh, this means that as the Russian army retreated, and retreat it did, it destroyed everything in its path so the French would find neither food nor shelter as they pursued deeper and deeper and deeper into the Russian interior. By September of 1812, Napoleon's army had finally reached the city of Moscow. However, when they entered the city, they found that it had been completely burnt to the ground by the retreating Russians. Now Napoleon's troops have no food and no shelter, with the brutal Russian winter fast approaching. Napoleon realizes that he has played right into Alexander's hands and walked right into a trap, because he has only two options. He can continue to pursue the Russians further into the Russian interior and basically assure themselves of being swallowed up by the Russian winter, or they can accept defeat and withdraw back to France. Either way, it's a lose-lose situation. And Napoleon doesn't like to lose, so he refuses to give the order to withdraw. And he waits, and he waits, and he waits, until finally in the dead of winter, Napoleon gives the order to retreat. But by now, it's too late. His armies are freezing, they're cold, they're starving, they're dying of disease, they're dying of starvation, they're dying of hypothermia. And as Napoleon's armies, demoralized and broken, begin retreating back into France, this is when the Russians attack, relentlessly attacking the French troops in the middle of a horrible, horrible Russian winter. Of the original 400,000 troops, only 10,000 make it out of Russia alive. The Russian campaign is a devastating defeat for Napoleon, one from which he will not recover. The defeat in Russia breaks the back of Napoleon's army. By March of 1814, a combined army of Russia, Prussia, Spain, England, and Austria is marching into Paris. Napoleon surrenders and is forced to abdicate from power. After his defeat, Napoleon is exiled to the tiny island of Elba off the coast of Italy. But he wouldn't stay there very long. Within a year, Napoleon escaped from exile, returned to France, and retook control of the French government. Uh, he would reign again as emperor, but again, not for very long, only for a hundred days. And that's because even though he announced he only wanted peace, his enemies refused to believe him. They quickly assembled a coalition and marched their armies against the general, wanting to take him out of commission once and for all. And the final battle for Napoleon would take place at Waterloo in present-day Belgium. On June 18, 1815, Napoleon faced a coalition army of England, the Netherlands, and Prussia. And the coalition forces were led by his old nemesis, Arthur Wellesley, now the Duke of Wellington. And there, at Waterloo, Napoleon was defeated for the last time. Wellesley soundly defeated the now old general uh, at the Battle of Waterloo, bringing Napoleon's storied military career and reign to an end. Following his defeat at Waterloo, Napoleon was exiled to the tiny island of St. Helena. He died there in 1821. And after his defeat, the map of Europe was redrawn, and the old monarchies were all put back in power. But despite Napoleon's defeat and exile, his influence on politics, society, and warfare would remain for years to come and can still even be felt today. 
So we saw the rise and fall of Napoleon, how he came to power, what he did while in power, and ultimately his demise. But remember to be thinking about how all of this aligns the ideas of the Enlightenment and classical liberalism, and be ready to talk about that point the next time that we meet. And as always, until that time, I bid you farewell.